nationally and international fame. Um, this title of this talk is Fasting for Acute Heart Failure. It's delivered by Dr. Anand Chakalingam. I had, uh, I wondered how I was gonna introduce Anand, who's my colleague, and I remember in 1968, the Beatles, one of the most popular and prolific uh, rock groups in the history of rock and roll, were exhausted. And if you remember, they went and visited the leader of transcendental meditation in India, the Maharishi. And after that, they became possibly, they began one of the most productive times in their careers with 48 publications, I think. And many of those songs ended up on their famous White Album. In a sense, we are undergoing a reawakening with Dr. Chakalingam. He's published over 60 original papers, mainly many on the role of stress and health. He lectures nationally and internationally. Um, he has an eight week course of heartful living. He has uh, developed a six hour course for medical students here at the university and elsewhere, also for residents and fellows for prevent burnout, help resilience. He also works with High Life, a nonprofit organization committed to enhancement of health and wellness for cardiac patients and for physicians. He's now going to take us into this very interesting field of acute heart failure and what we can learn from Siddha, basic science, and high life. Welcome, Dr. Chakalingam. Thanks so much, Dr. Flaker, for that kind introduction. We'll go ahead and get started. Thanks so much to so many people who have uh, joined us from India, Europe, and the US. So the topic is fasting for acute heart failure. What do we learn from Siddha wisdom, basic science, animal studies, and from our five years of heartful living, which we now online call it high life. So the disclosure is this high life journey website, which uh, aims at empowering people to gain more uh, confidence and uh, health through self-inquiry at no cost, anytime, anywhere in the world. And Seeking a Hunger is a small book that aims at uh, improving the understanding behind why we should seek uh, better health through fasting. So the object is of today's discussion will be how obesity contributes to acute heart failure, obesity paradox in heart failure, what diet and how it plays a critical role in heart failure outcomes, self-inquiry and the dramatic results we have seen in the last few years in select cardiac patients. We'll start off with a few questions. If anyone uh, strongly feels, uh, I'm welcoming them to unmute themselves, but otherwise we'll come back to these questions in about 45 minutes when I'm hopefully through my presentation. So current heart failure guidelines recommend a BMI of 34 to be left alone because of obesity paradox. Is this true or false? The second question is cardiovascular benefits of exercise training can be matched by just sitting around and fasting. Fasting improves heart attack and heart failure outcomes 300%. Biological age in young, healthy, normal weight individuals can be reversed. That means they may get younger even when they are healthy with calorie restriction. The only way to sustainably lose weight is through a weight reduction gastric bypass surgery. Stage C heart failure with clinically manifest uh, decompensation implies irreversible damage and cannot get back to a normal functioning heart. Fasting 
causes uh, one liter water loss, salt loss in the first day of fasting itself. We start with a patient. This is a patient I saw first time a few months ago, 65 year old male presenting with shortness of breath, at rest, leg edema, blood pressure is elevated. He's been hypertensive, diabetic, CKD, albuminuria, and uh, CHF, EF is only 25%, chronic atrial fibrillation, severe mitral regurgitation, moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation, pulmonary hypertension, and uh, he was needing hospitalization for uh, class four symptoms, morbidly obese with uh, volume overload, uh, gets around only on a wheelchair. When I asked him, what do you feel like? He said, I feel like I'm over 80 years old. He comes in for a second opinion to us. What would you recommend at 65? A cardiac cath, a cardiac MRI to evaluate for viability, mitral, either surgical or uh, percutaneous repair, gastric bypass surgery to lose weight, which would help him, and then uh, just do high life. This is the challenge faced by this patient and so many other people with heart failure. They are like this uh, truck trying to get somewhere with too much uh, overload of uh, capacity. And then the other challenges, they are running low, sometimes very, very low on reserve. And the third challenge is they are not even sure what they are fighting for. The visibility is so poor and the road ahead is not clear at all. So this is the real challenge so many of our patients face in heart failure. We know that one in three deaths in the US occur due to cardiovascular disease. About 6.2 million adults in the US have heart failure with over 1 million ER visits annually. Heart failure itself costs over $30 billion in 2012. Much of this can be improved with lifestyle. This is a quick uh, look at where uh, heart failure rates are and uh, mortality is uh, concentrated in uh, places where we see more obesity. And that's what I'm showing here. Compared to the 1960s, every decade we've been seeing an increase in obesity. And by 2030, it's projected to cross 50% of our population. That is for obesity. If you compare the major countries uh, in Japan and Korea, obesity is still less than 5%. Much of Europe is at about uh, uh, 15%, whereas the US is uh, at 30%. Urban India. The big cities like Chennai, Delhi, they are already at uh, over 30, 35%. Overweight, anybody above the BMI of 25, if you take it, that is 73% already. So obesity is only 30. The overweight BMI of 25 to 30 is nearly half the population. So altogether, it becomes a bigger challenge. Between the age of two to five, obesity is at 13%. In childhood, it is at 20%. Adults have 40% obesity in the most recent surveys. Heart failure, annual hospitalization is over 1 million in the US and in Europe. More than 90% were due to symptoms and signs of excess fluid. Readmission rate at 30 days is 24%, three months is 30%, and by six months, 50%. Acute heart failure in hospital mortality is at 4%. Within three months, 10% of the heart failure patients are dead. By one year, it is closer to one third. And by five years, 75% of heart failure patients are uh, not making it. We know heart failure is uh, divided into preserved and reduced ejection fraction. And then there is this borderline category. And uh, what we are seeing is uh, incidence is uh, pretty high. If you look at uh, the maladaptive response that goes on, and uh, there is progressive remodeling because of neuroendocrine activation, inflammation, and increasing heart rate. So these are the major players. And if you look at natural history, they have acute exacerbations, 
And with optimal evidence-based therapy, we are trying to uh, keep them alive and keep them out of trouble a little longer. But then this comorbidities that they deal with, like uh, pulmonary problems, uh, arthritis, neurological issues, more importantly, hepatic, and now the biggest challenge being cardiorenal syndrome. All these comorbidities increased uh, challenges that our patients face significantly. So when we say acute heart failure, we mean two things. One, if it's the first episode, or if it is a patient with a known heart failure who's having acute decompensation. So what we have to recognize is underlying cardiac dysfunction, new onset cardiac dysfunction, and chronic cardiac dysfunction because of acute precipitating factors that ends up with heart failure, preserved ejection fraction, reduced ejection fraction, pulmonary congestion, RV issues, and then systemic condition that leads to major organ dysfunction. I'm going to request everyone to mute yourself. Neuroendocrine stimulation and inflammation play a key role in this vicious cycle and disease progression. I'm not going to spend too much time, but this is what uh, we are dealing with. Multiple organs being affected by uh, aldosterone axis, inflammation, and uh, perfusion issues. Same things, I'm going to skip through some of this, but all these things are so closely interrelated. The way we look at heart failure is whether they are warm and dry, warm and wet, cold or cold and wet. So this makes it even more challenging. If they are wet, vasodilators, diuretics work. If they are cold, fluids might help and inotropes may be considered. But then when they are more hemodynamically compromised, then we have to resort to more advanced therapies. So the acute treatment is to treat the congestion, identify precipitating factors and comorbidities and treat accordingly. The long-term treatment in uh, the preserved ejection fraction is treating the comorbidities, whereas if there is a reduced ejection fraction, we have a whole host of treatments. I'm not going to go into the details. That includes uh, aldosterone antagonists, ACE inhibitors, hydralazine nitrates, ICD, Syria, uh, uh, cardiac resynchronization therapies. And now we have added SGLT2 antagonists and uh, how we can optimize care is an ongoing challenge for our heart failure patients. This is by the most recent 2021 guidelines. And then when I looked at the same uh, updates, how much is obesity uh, referred to and addressed? If you look at valve diseases, there are strong evidence for fixing it. If you look at uh, obesity, the evidence is weak because there is no evidence to say fixing obesity improves heart failure. And this is the most recent 2020 uh, comorbidities survey of patients in heart failure. And this is what they came back with. Cholesterol, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, coronary. Obesity does not even feature in this uh, list of comorbidities. And that is because of what we call the obesity paradox. In heart failure, obesity, which is defined as BMI more than 30, is paradoxically associated with improved survival. So this is the challenge that uh, practitioners have to face. Obesity uh, paradox appears to exist across the BMI levels for patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, but not with preserved ejection fraction. That's what the most recent uh, evidence suggesting. So. Uh, mortality goes up when the BMI drops below uh, 30. All-cause mortality 30 days and at one year after discharge seems to be more if uh, BMI is lesser. So that is the obesity paradox. And if you look at uh, renal paradox uh, or so many other uh, hypertension paradox, what we are seeing again and again is population studies seem to suggest that the sweet spot for BMI is between 20 and 25. So if you are underweight, your uh, risk goes up. But if your uh, BMI is more than 25, the risk for uh, long-term outcomes goes up significantly. But if you look at the paradox in patients with obesity and the CKD and uh, heart failure, 
the sweet spot seems to be between 30 and 35. So that's why when we see a patient who has a BMI of 34, we are not sure sometimes whether recommending weight loss is helpful. So these are some of the studies, which I'm not going to go into detail, but that look at the most uh, recent evidence on the obesity paradox. But if you see here on the right side, it is confined to 30 days or one year outcomes only, sometimes maximum three years. And that's why if you look at the most recent European guidelines, they say obesity is also a risk factor for heart failure, but the impact of treatment of obesity on the development of heart failure is unknown. Weight loss as an intervention has never been prospectively shown to either benefit or uh, reduce problems in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. In patients with uh, obesity, with BMI below 35, weight loss cannot be recommended. In more advanced obesity, which is more than 35, weight loss may be considered to manage symptoms and exercise capacity. This is what the most recent guidelines are saying. And the reason I think this is the uh, uh, concern is because when we say BMI-based obesity, we are talking about uh, only one aspect. We are not looking at uh, muscle, and that plays a significant role in these patients. So I'm not going to go into more details here, but we know if you look at people based on their fitness level, which means this can correlate with lean body mass. This suggests that the more fit we are, we have a better chance of survival, starting out at the age of 55. This is one of the important studies that came out quite a while ago in a Framingham study that looks at people with normal weight versus obese and overweight. And what they are saying is incidence of heart failure for people at age of 55 and followed for 14 years for every one BMI increase the risk of uh, heart failure increased five to seven percent. And obesity doubles the risk of heart failure uh, back to patients with a normal BMI. So this is a prospective study over a 15 year time frame. So that is the big challenge, but I feel obesity paradox strongly is related to studies being of short term duration. Cachexia acutely kills. So that's why when we see normal BMI in obesity patients, that may not be a good predictor. Metabolic reserve is low uh, and earlier presentation happens in obese people because they are already on the bigger side and they're not able to tolerate heart failure. And the muscle mass and strength may be actually a little more in obese people because they are coping with excess weight. We don't have good data on weight reduction through lifestyle and cardiovascular disease despite normal BMI is the real challenge for these people. So they have other problems and uh, they are not amenable to lifestyle resulting in the obesity paradox, by which what I'm trying to say here is obesity is not healthy. If you look at the cardio renal syndrome type one, which is acute heart failure causing acute renal failure, you see that in nearly half the patients that present to us with uh, clinical heart failure uh, in about 15% uh, coronary syndromes, and over 20% with cardiac surgery. This again is a busy slide showing the uh, key factors that contribute to the kidney dysfunction, neurological sequelae of coronary events requiring renal replacement therapy and uh, ending up with chronic kidney and heart failure and uh, further uh, recurrent hospitalizations and mortality. Again, we'll not go through these busy slides. The reason I leave them here is because they'll be available for you to review in these recording uh, presentations. But if you look at obesity, there are numerous mechanisms, including hemodynamic changes, uh, the fat itself, the inflammatory component from this uh, adipose tissue, uh, lipid abnormalities, and the resultant comorbidities from obesity, like diabetes, sleep apnea, hypoventilation that leads to pulmonary hypertension. All these things contribute in numerous uh, mechanisms to diastolic stiffness, as well as direct systolic dysfunction and uh, heart failure. How does the heart get its energy? This is an important thing to recognize. Heart is omnivorous. It takes fat ketones, glucose, lactate, and is able to convert it into energy to help it function. 
because this is heart and the brain are uh, so important for survival that they have developed over millennia so many ways of uh, surviving despite adverse conditions. When we look at uh, heart failure, there was one evidence for obesity paradox and so many other things. But when we look at cardiovascular aging and longevity studies, there is no ambiguity. Uh, people from uh, blue zones where they eat lesser food, they end up surviving much longer, healthier with less dementia. The mechanisms being improved oxidative stress, inflammatory, uh, reduced inflammation, better glucose metabolism, that means reduced uh, metabolic syndrome and diabetes, lesser lipid disorders, vascular compliance, and uh, telomere uh, lengthening. These are the mechanisms by which we are able to reduce uh, the effect of aging. And uh, inflammation plays a key role, glucose metabolism and uh, telomere length play a key role in improving uh, biological age. When we look at heart failure, we are looking at reducing volume and uh, inotropes to improve contractility and vasodilatation, nitrates for venodilatation, diuretics uh, to get the volume uh, removed from the body, as well as uh, uh, continuous uh, airway support to improve pulmonary circulation. This is an important uh, look at just uh, interval eating. They are not doing calorie restriction, but by eating instead of uh, 16 hours a day, they are uh, doing a time-restricted eat, eating for uh, only 10 hours. That means 14 hours of no food in day. That causes significant improvement in uh, weight, waist circumference, blood pressure, LDL, hemoglobin A1C, and uh, improved sleep. So that's why instead of focusing on specific DASH diet or Mediterranean diet, more and more interest is now seen as far as cardiovascular health and endothelial function uh, with using calorie restriction and intermittent fasting. So overnutrition, which is the biggest challenge the whole world is now facing, leads to impaired uh, sympathetic activation, insulin resistance, that, that can directly lead to myocardial dysfunction and problems. The mechanisms have been beautifully described as far as how intermittent fasting as well as calorie restriction help in a review in New England Journal. I'm not again going to go through the details. And uh, they are showing how all these key mechanisms of uh, autophagy, uh, systemic resistance, and uh, brain function are improved by fasting. And these effects are mediated through the liver, peripheral muscle, heart, brain, adipose tissue, and gut. And the intermittent fasting acutely helps uh, and uh, improves uh, uh, recovery, but in the long term, the benefits are even more sustained. And the fasting, when we say it can be for uh, more duration, but what we are recommending in our program is not a strict regimen. We ask patients to explore it on their own. So we can improve so many factors through calorie restriction as far as renal perfusion, endothelial function, and cardiovascular outcomes. So I'm going to switch gears and look at some of the new studies with SGLT receptor antagonists and uh, heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. If you look at heart failure patients, they are roughly in their 60s, and uh, SGLT receptor antagonism seems to improve uh, heart failure outcomes. And uh, if you look at... Uh, the more recent studies, what we are seeing here, I want to show you, is the BMI. Heart failure patients have a BMI which is now averaging 30. So this is the real challenge. And uh, what uh, we are seeing here is uh, how these SGLT antagonists work on the heart, either through uh, immune uh, reactions and uh, autophagy, and through uh, improved uh, sympathetic activation and renal function. CKD itself, there are numerous mechanisms that are being proposed for how these SGLT receptor antagonists work, reducing albuminuria, reducing salt load, inflammatory response, blood pressure, 
direct uh, cardiovascular effects and reduced uh, glomerular filtration rate. This is a, a study that looks at fasting. And what they are saying here is if you fast for two to seven days, they are calling it a short fast. This is all water only fast. And medium fast is for closer to 10 days. Long fast is closer to two to three weeks. And extended fast is over three weeks of only water. And when they do this type of fasting, this is from a North, uh, True North uh, program, which is in uh, California. And what they are looking here is their adverse events. And they're not seeing any major complications, but they are monitoring them very closely every day. They are in the center with physician supervision every day, getting blood testing, uh, vital checks, and uh, symptom uh, management. So this is what they are reporting fatigue, insomnia, nausea, headaches, and hypertension. Now I'm going to switch gears again and show you uh, what happens to a Burmese python that consumes a rodent, which is 25% of the snake's body mass uh, itself. So when the python consumes this meal, this is over several days, what happens? Uh, the cardiac output goes up several fold, heart rate goes up significantly and stroke volume goes up substantially. So this is what happens to the heart after such a huge meal. But uh, we are human beings. Our metabolism is different. We don't consume 25% of our body mass. We consume only 0.4% of our body mass. But even for us, our uh, uh, cardiac output has to go up and our gastrointestinal flow also has to go up when we consume our routine meals. And the increase is pretty similar to what happens with exercise. So digestion generally generates about uh, close to 100 to 200% increase in oxygen consumption, cardiac output, and in gastrointestinal blood flow. The magnitude of intestinal hyperemia depends on the consumption of the meal, composition, the meal size, and whether the gut is competing with other tissues for survival. So what do we learn from rat studies? Rats and mice in the first week of alternate day fasting. These are healthy mice and rats, which are not obese and are fed, fed normal diets. But if you still give them food only every other day, what happens to them? The heart rate and blood pressure improve significantly. And they continue to decrease after two weeks and remain reduced on both fasting and the non-fasting days. The benefits seem to be more for intermittent fasting and rather than calorie restriction. The mechanism they are proposing is likely the intermittent bioenergetic challenge may promote optimal cardiovascular health. And the surprising thing is the benefits are similar to what is seen with exercise. One of the studies I wanted to show you is uh, where intermittent fasting was done for three months on two month old uh, uh, mouse model. And then they did a coronary ligation, which means we are inducing a heart attack because it's an animal, we can do it. And what we are seeing is uh, compared to um, controls, the size of the heart attack was two and a half times smaller. Fasting is similar to ischemic preconditioning, which we are very familiar with and fasting may not only improve outcome after a coronary event, but also reduce the risk for atherosclerosis and long-term coronary events as well. Now, they are doing the coronary ligation first. So what about uh, animals that are trying fasting after the event? So what happens is coronary ligation leads to ischemic cardiomyopathy, and then they are trying fasting two weeks later. In this animal model, what they are seeing is, chronic intermittent fasting markedly improves the long-term heart failure survival by several mechanisms, angiogenics, uh, apoptosis, and remodeling effects. Whereas more than 75% of the rats on the alternate uh, day fasting diet survived during the eight-week post-MI period, only 25% of the rats on the normal diet survived. So this is the 300% improvement in heart failure survival that fasting after the event is caused. Coming to humans, what do we know? We know of uh, blue zones, 
in Japan, Greece, Italy, Costa Rica, and California, where people end up living on average 10 and 15 years longer with a better health span, even into their 90s and 100 years of age, without going to retirement homes because they are still active members contributing to the community. So Beagle took a world tour in, 19, in 1831 from uh, uh, London all the way to Galapagos, across the Pacific Ocean and returned. And this journey led Darwin several years later to publish the seminal work, which is uh, our recognition of uh, evolution itself. So before this uh, understanding, we did not know where we came from. I'm going to take you back 5,000 years to the first grammar text that I know of in any language. It is called the Tolkapian. And this is the person who wrote this book. And uh, what he is saying in that book, I've shown here, he says, Evolution starts with a sense of touch, which is present in plants, then taste in fish, smell in termites, sight in beetles, hearing in beasts. And then he talks about humans who have achieved consciousness. And then we can recognize super consciousness. So what I'm trying to say here is uh, there has been a science behind uh, so much of work that has gone on for five, 10,000 years. And this science is uh, in the form of uh, Tamil medicine called Siddha. Siddhas were first scientists, then there were saints, doctors, alchemists, and mystics all put together. Agathya is considered the first Siddha. And this is what uh, is one of the Siddha poems, which says, if you can do well, uh, if you can do with two meals in a day, then you will have very good health. If you can figure out a way to survive and sustain yourself with just one meal every day, that leads directly to higher consciousness. That's what this is saying, you become a yogi. Uh, Dr. Arul Amudan has joined us today. Uh, he is a Siddha practitioner in India and uh, he shared this with me. The Siddha diet plan requests us to consider eating 50% of our stomach capacity with food, 25% with water, and 15% just leave it empty with air. Fasting is an excellent therapy. That's what the Siddha proverb, Patini Peru Marind is saying. And uh, Dr. Arul says, I advise filling the stomach with liquids 30 minutes before a solid meal, which will reduce the quantity of food intake. So next, we are going to move to flow. Mihai checks in Mihai talks about this in 1975. And this has uh, given birth to positive psychology and uh, so much of uh, science and how we can improve our health through the positive aspects of our mindset. Flow describes a positive engagement with a particular task, and this is free from self-consciousness and intrinsically enjoyable. The short of this is, for instance, uh, if we have skills on the x-axis, whatever challenge we have to face on the y-axis, if uh, we have the optimal skill and challenge balance, we have a chance, one in 10 chance of entering flow. Say for instance, I play tennis. If I play tennis with uh, Roger Federer, I'll end up being anxious, self-conscious and worried. And so that won't allow me to enter into flow. If I were to play tennis with uh, somebody who's never been on the tennis court, I'll be bored and that's not gonna be fun. But if I, if I were to play with uh, some of my colleagues here who are uh, enthusiastic tennis players, I'll have a chance one in 10 of entering into flow. Why do I worry about entering into flow? Because Mihai Chekmanya says that this is an excellent way to connect with your highest uh, consciousness. And that is what uh, we have known from Tirukkural for several thousand years. And the same x-axis talks about gratitude. Nandri marappadu nandri, nandralladu andre marappadu nandri. Be more grateful and forget instantly any uh, harm done to you. And then about grad fasting, what they are saying is, what this means is explore healthy foods and eat only, only when you're really, really hungry. 
And this will allow us to engage more passionately, meaningfully with a deeper mind-body connection. The life's highlight is being passionate. Just existing is a disgrace to your existence itself. So that much importance has been given for several thousand years in our culture for being passionate and being connected at the mind-body level and uh, finding flow. This flow that we now recognize in the Western system uh, is for specific events, whereas for life throughout 24-7, we can experience flow if we are meaningfully able to connect with ourselves. And this is symbolized beautifully by the first uh, festival of the year, Pongal, which is the harvest festival. And what we do is deliberately let the boiling rice overflow to signify that life is not about sur surviving. Life is about finding that abundance in our day-to-day -day living itself. Ogam is a word uh, which implies we can do exercise, classical bardhanatyam and meditation all at once. And this is symbolized in uh, our uh, Tamil uh, depiction of uh, Lord Siva, where he is doing all the three at the same time. So there are several records of uh, this over 5,000 years in our tra tradition. This is not related to any religion, actually, or even India. Humanity and the individual awakening of ourselves at the consciousness level is the real uh, goal of Siddha medicine. Uh, this flow that we talk about is our inner nature and equality of for all life, irrespective of where we are and wherever situation, health, age, religion, community, time, space, wherever it is, equality is what they talk about in uh, Siddha tradition. So that's what human beings are about. The word homo sapien means the wise humans. We are self-aware. That's what we've proclaimed. We are free and we are celebrating life. We've been around for 300,000 years. Siddha has been here for 10,000 years. Ogam, yoga has been around for 5,000 years. We started our journey in 2010, asking our patients to smile 20 times every hour. Heartful living we've been doing for the last five to six years on Fridays as a in-person clinic for 20 patients, families, and their uh, providers and nurses and administrative staff to try to recognize the benefits of uh, holistic living through a deeper mind-body connection, higher uh, consciousness. And then high life, thanks to the coronavirus, we had to move online. And now all of this is recorded and available as a different series that we've been doing continuously from 2020. And all of this is made available at uh, www.highlifejourney.org. So when we talk about heart failure, we see obesity is there in 50% of the patients, overweight in 95% of our patients, diabetes in half the patients, coronary artery disease in nearly two thirds and hypertension in nearly everybody we see with heart failure. We'll take a 59 year old with heart failure, atrial fibrillation and hypertension. She ends up losing 60 pounds in three months through our uh, high life program. And now she feels seven years younger. This is her medical record from 2018, how much weight she has lost and how she is continuing to feel more energetic. This we have just published talking about our traditional consciousness versus higher consciousness. And what we are requesting people to engage in is to explore yourself, breaking through the logical mind and conscious thinking to find gratitude and connect at your own inner creativity, harness the a deeper uh, core of your consciousness, the core being humility, empathy, aspiration, reciprocation, which allows you to find the trust. So all our traditional learning accumulated over generations and leading to our power and wealth and skills and habits is uh, traditional, but a self-inquiry is somewhat different in the sense that it requires you to actively unlearn. Every day we start from zero, no matter where we are. And this is the real reason for our lasting fulfillment and happiness allows us to become more resilient and embrace new challenges. The tools for self-inquiry are mindfulness, gratitude, creativity, flow, fasting, ikigai, and silence. So self-inquiry means gratitude, stress reduction, and optimism, which leads to better uh, ability to cope with hunger, flow, mind-body connection, leading to better heart health. So this is what the VA provides currently. 
a 2000 calorie diet, which is a little lesser if we ask for a heart healthy diet with 2000 grams of sodium. We teach emotional versus habitual eating versus physical hunger. And this is the hunger scale. We, even if we go to starving, we will not faint if we are able to smile and drink some water. We can engage in natural ketosis with gratitude for more than just life with uh, people and circumstances. We can be able to connect at a deeper level. So intermittent fasting means uh, ability to uh, go for up to 30% calorie restriction, whereas hunger gratitude is more of a meditative program where so much of the psychological benefits are added on top of the fasting benefits. And we can go even further, 50, 70% calorie restriction. And people are feeling so much more alive today rather than just uh, aiming at living longer, we can start to feel more energetic and alive today. So what we recommend is 14 hours of uh, uh, eating, which is what most people do. Instead, we are trying to restrict eating to between lunch and an early dinner, whereas they can get 16, 18, 20 hours of fasting while they are in the hospital. So this we know is uh, inflammatory food and uh, anti-inflammatory food. We feel the most anti-inflammatory diet may be no food itself. And uh, what we recommend is generally eating with family, taking 20 minutes to eat, avoiding all drinks and snacks, except water being the biggest important uh, drink and uh, minimize processed meats, added sugars and oils, preferably cook at home. Only 10% of the food that you can buy in the stores is healthy. Find fiber in the fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and keep the plate colorful and eat only when you're really hungry with gratitude. Celebrate the eating itself. Smile 20 times and there are so many reasons for that. How do we practically do this? How do our patients find that uh, uh, they can stay healthy? The reason is animal studies have shown both these monkeys are of the same age, but by calorie restriction, this monkey looks, acts, and as biologically not aged. And this has been studied in humans now in a study called Calorie 2, it's published in Lancet, 25% calorie restriction in young, healthy adults who are of only BMI of 25, they were able to lose 10 kilograms in two years. And these parameters, looking at their blood pressure and metabolic parameters are all showing trend towards substantial improvement. So basically 35 year olds become closer to 25 year olds when they are already healthy. That is the power of calorie restriction. This is not just in humans. This slide applies to nearly all life forms. We are talking about systemic resilience. Social stress reduces our resilience, but if we do calorie restriction and physical exercise and sleep better, we can gain resilience. But if you look at aging process, it reduces our ability to cope with challenges. But if we are able to connect at a deeper level and improve our systemic resilience through calorie restriction, physical exercise, we may just not age. We will still die, but we'll die very healthy at a much older age. That's what this suggests. And that's what we've been trying to prove for the last 12 years. And these are our studies, which we've done now on older disabled patients to show that uh, exercise time can be improved despite disabilities at home when they're exercising and uh, gaining more uh, uh, confidence at the same time. We published some of this work, Hunger Gratitude in holistic conferences and uh, flow in heart failure patients and heart attack patients the exercise and awareness, smile experience. And uh, I'm gonna skip through some of this. This is what we are planning to do next. Visual analog scale for global assessment. The best I've ever felt versus worst I've ever felt. And this is what was a study published uh, recently on LASIK, which I'm showing here, how the visual analog scale works. And then fasting, we want to include people between the age of 20 to 85 admitted to our services here for acute decompensated heart failure with a BMI over 25, both at MU University and at our VA. We would like to exclude people with valve disease, pregnancy, diabetes type one, and uh, people with hypoglycemic episodes, advanced liver disease, 
uh, eating disorders and BMI less than 25. And prospectively, we'd like to study to see how much uh, heart healthy diet can improve. I'm going to skip through some of this. Then points that we want to look at are uh, uh, symptoms at uh, different time points for the first three to five days, acute renal dysfunction, length of stay, LASIX requirement, depression, anxiety, and optimism, weight reduction, compliance with medications, composite uh, endpoint of death, rehospitalization, and ER visits at 60 days. So these are things we are hoping to uh, improve. Mortality, symptoms, uh, diuretic requirement, rehospitalization, renal parameters, and exercise tolerance. We would be able to follow them every week, even after discharge, checking for new symptoms because of uh, fasting, including fatigue, syncope, hyperglycemia, increased uh, angina, fluid and overload and dyspnea. We want to track mortality, hospitalization for any reason and any cardiac arrest. This is a patient with uh, which I just saw very recently, we got this patient cast. She has LAD disease, RCA is critical. She has collateral flow to the PDA and she would like to try our Heartful Living program. After a few weeks, she sends us this glucose curve and this is what she says. My sugars are now better than they've ever been and I participated in your program. And uh, she does not want stenting. We want to repeat her cath and we expect some of this to have improved without any revascularization. So we come back to this patient that we started off with. EF is 25, patient has valve disease, right heart, left heart failure, volume overload. Look at his creatinine. Since he first saw us, it's come down significantly. His albumin area has gone down dramatically. This is his weight since he started our program. From 156, it's come down about uh, 10 kilograms, which is closer to 20, 25 pounds. And this is a story. Three months later, his EF on repeat echo is 40%. Blood pressure is much better controlled. He's not needing LASIKs anymore. Renal parameters, albuminuria is better. Mitral and tricuspid agitation is better. Instead of feeling like an 80 year old, now the 65 year old feels like he's only 50 years. He's connected with gratitude and he's able to fast for 20 hours, two times in a week. That's what he's doing. He's still not gone to the cath lab. He's still not had that MRI. So this is what uh, we know as far as uh, evidence-based science with uh, cardiovascular risk reduction based on a study called Look Ahead. And what they did is uh, took people uh, between the age of 45 and 75 with diabetes and uh, they tried to see how after five to 10 years of uh, aggressive risk factor control, what happens. And they are uh, not able to sustain any significant improvement in uh, uh, lifestyle. So that's why we are not seeing an improvement through this aggressive lifestyle intervention in outcomes. So I don't think this is a failure of the intervention uh, in uh, improving outcome. I feel it is the failure of the intervention in reducing the cardiovascular uh, risk factors. This is one way where we can actually reduce weight. BMI of 40 is brought down and kept five years, 10 years, 20 years at a 7% reduction only through surgery. This is what the Western science currently says. And that is through various gastric bypass surgery procedures. And if you see them, life expectancy for obesity is eight years lesser than controls. But through bariatric surgery, we can uh, add back three years. So this is substantial if we can add back three years. And that's what we are seeing here. Compared to normals, um, people who are obese die sooner. But if you undergo gastric bypass surgery, if you have a BMI of 40 and you are in the right age range, your survival will be improved. This is what science tells us currently. So lifestyle, we know, can reduce weight by up to about five to six percent over five to ten years. That's all lifestyle can do. Bariatric surgery can achieve 16 percent, whereas in high life over the last three years we are seeing the same 16 percent, plus we are seeing so much more in the form of mind-body benefits. This is a study thanks to my dad who's joined us. He said, Anand, look at uh, um, 
postprandial angina. You will find evidence for it. And that's what I found. In 2002, a beautiful study looked at uh, healthy controls and coronary artery disease patients. And what they are seeing is after food, blood pressure systolic goes up, diastolic goes down, heart rate goes up. Ultimately, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, um, systolic pressure product goes up significantly. And this trend is seen in coronary lesions and in healthy controls. So that's the important thing. So the steel phenomenon may play an important role in postprandial angina, along with increase in heart rate, increase in systolic pressure, and redistribution to the gut. So not only in uh, the python that is consuming a big rodent, even in humans who are consuming a smaller portion, we are facing these challenges when we put food in our body. So what I feel is the ogam or the energy benefits of fasting in acute heart failure is improved resilience, empowerment, gratitude. They are able to smile more in the hospital. They are able to meditate while they are having heart failure, connecting with their religion if they are religious, connecting with uh, more happiness. And at the mind level, it has an antidepressant effect, empowerment, confidence. They have more focus, optimism, and relaxation. And at the body level, which we are looking for first, is there is no postprandial hyperemia. That is a huge benefit. Fasting causes diuresis. I did not bring the slides today, but fasting causes uh, one uh, kilogram um, water loss in animals and in humans. And this we have known for like 50 years. That slide I forgot to bring in today, but I can share it with anyone interested. Natriuresis, reduced blood pressure, improved endothelial function, reduced arterial stiffness, albuminuria, energy substrate, Ketones are so much more uh, stable energy form for the heart when it's in failure. Reduced inflammation is so important. And the benefits may be mimicking that of actual exercise training. That's what animal models are telling us. So all these benefits we can have in the acute phase when patients are hospitalized with heart failure. So this is a patient who comes in. And uh, again, these are all medical records. So from 2018, the weight has stayed off. That's what I want to share here. For want of time, I'm not going to too much detail, but the way this patient has done this is uh, through calorie restriction. And uh, he's doing uh, 24 hour fasting one to two times in a week and he has lost 60 pounds. And he has all these risk factors that we traditionally see. This patient also has several risk factors. Uh, I, I shouldn't say risk factors, they already have the heart failure, but along with the risk factors. There is a 65 pound weight reduction that has happened over uh, two to three years and is sustaining. And this is a professor here who has uh, started 36 hour fasting two times a week and he's continuing to lose weight. This is the same graph that I'm showing to you again and again, just to say the same point. This patient also has cirrhosis, despite that she's able to do calorie restriction. And look at the age of this patient who's taking this up and look at this time course over so many years. And all these people are, not only uh, metabolically looking better, but their confidence level is uh, uh, sky high. This is another patient with very similar multivessel uh, PCI who's doing so much better. This patient has one meal only six days of the week. So this is more dramatic, but he's able to keep off much of that weight. At 73, he needed two weeks in the hospital to first get him stabilized. After that, after the 2019, he's not needed any more hospitalizations at all. So this patient follows several of our suggestions and only continues to keep losing weight. This is a truck drivers. They are so challenging because their lifestyle is very challenging. And he's continuing to stay off several medicines with our program. This is most mind-blowing graph. You're looking at 2006. When I first started seeing this patient, when I came to the University of Missouri, and this patient continues to lose weight. I can't take credit for the first several years. She was already on the path. But I think I started seeing her around 2012. And this is the type of graph which is available in our medical records, and we can easily look it up. I think this is the best parameter of how a patient can do better moving forward. So I want to thank my collaborators. And uh, in uh, cardiology, we have so many people here, Senthil, Raj, uh, Mauricio, Dr. Flaker, and Dr. Agarwal are our mentors across the street at the VA and here. 
and uh, we have uh, people in Siddha Medicine who've joined us, uh, Dr. Selva Shanmugam, uh, Dr. Arulamadan, Gunasegaram Krishnaswamy, and uh, Saranan Kupaswamy is uh, our own uh, resident fellow and faculty who is now in Atlanta, and he's trying to help us make the connection between uh, Siddha and uh, Western Medicine to improve the health of people all over. And I want to thank people in uh, psychology and uh, exercise and nutrition, Jill Canelli, who is helping us, and uh, Christy Bergen and Madison Ellison. And all these questions that I asked, the dramatic answer to this is, this is what the guidelines are saying. Don't do anything if the BMI is 34. Cardiovascular uh, benefits are the same as if you are exercising, if you can just fast. And uh, fasting improves in animal models, uh, heart failure outcomes 300%. It's not 30% like we see in ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. Biological age can be reversed with calorie restriction, young, healthy people. Way to lose weight is not only through gastric bypass. If we can engage our mind, if we can trust ourselves, we can go as far as we want with weight reduction and everybody can do this. And uh, stage C heart failure does not mean anything in our uh, practice over the last five know. years. Fasting causes one liter fluid loss. You don't even need Lasix, just not putting food in the body causes uh, weight reduction. And uh, this is all that we talk about in the last two years at least is available at High Life Journey and even today's a discussion we will make it available within the next three to five days at high life journey so you can contact me and uh, uh, connect through this program anybody can uh, view all these lectures and uh, the entire eight hour high life uh, program that we do for patient wellness this year and last year we also did a advanced heart for living series all that is available at high life so this seeking hunger is a book that i wrote which is only like one hour read it's very easy for students in school, heart patients who are in their 80s, and everyone in between, including physicians. I invite people to read this so that we can connect a little better with ourselves. That's all this is about. So today we talked about how fasting can help in uh, heart failure chronically and acutely. We didn't spend much time on gratitude and the other four steps which uh, are available. And uh, these things which we talk about are flow and meditation and altruism, which we'll do some other time. So this question that I asked you, how do my heart failure patient who feels like this overburden get better? It's not easy, right? But we have shown over the last three to five years that so many of our patients are getting better. I'll tell you the secret in pictures. The road looks bad, but with gratitude, we can clear our consciousness. That's the first step by smiling 20 times every hour voluntarily. Then this gas tank being empty, how do we deal with that? This is the acute heart failure patient hospitalized trying to breathe. For him, I'm telling him the road is going downward. So the hunger gives him the ability with an empty tank to continue the journey. And thirdly, if you continue in this high life, you will realize that all that excess weight can go and you're not even dependent on gas, you can function on electricity, by which I mean uh, fat burning or uh, metabolic switching or natural ketosis. So that is what we are able to engage uh, through the mind-body connection that uh, Siddha has provided and uh, our patients have shown that it works over the last five years. So to summarize, Hunger, gratitude, and heart failure improves resilience chronically. Cardiovascular risk factors greater than 15% weight reduction. Exercise tolerance improves and optimism increases. But in the acute heart failure patients, it empowers them in the hospital, reduces the need for Lasix, beta blockers, digoxin, SGLT antagonists, and amiodarone I'm throwing in there. I don't have evidence for it. I searched it today morning. But maybe in the next uh, six months, we might uh, check this out in... Uh, electrical storm and see if uh, fasting may work to help uh, reduce arrhythmia burden in our patients. So I'm going to stop here and uh, I'm sorry I took more time than I wanted to but I am opening this to questions and discussion and uh, we really want to advance the science in this uh, new area that we are trying to explore in our university and our VA looking at heart failure and fasting acutely.
Thanks so much. Thank you, Anand. Outstanding as usual. Any, any comments from the audience? Dr. Chakalingam, the real Dr. Chakalingam from India or Dr. Hi, Kubis good Swami. morning. Uh, good morning. This is Dr. Datta from Nephrology. Uh, Dr. Chaklingam, thank you so much for your nice presentation. I have just uh, one, um, uh, one comment uh, regarding, uh, suppose, uh, prolonged fasting or um, reduced calorie intake uh, all will lead to low albumin level. Now, low albumin level, as we know that cardiac failure or heart failure is a catabolic state. By all these measures, are we going to initiate another catabolic state by encouraging low albumin level, which can further lead to uh, stimulating the cytokines to cause the cardiac cachexia? If the so how do you see, yes. how do you see this relationship between the fasting and cardiac cachexia and how can it create impact on cardiorespiratory fitness? It's a very, very important challenge, especially in our heart failure patients and cardiorenal syndrome patients. If the BMI is below 25, calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, all this becomes a challenge. But uh, protein intake should be optimal, but even then we can try intermittent fasting. But for anybody above a BMI of 25, intermittent fasting a few hours, on one or two occasions in a week is what we'll recommend with adequate protein supplementation. We do not need to cut the protein intake down and albumin levels should not come down, which will actually improve is what I suspect. And this long fasting of more than one day, two days that I showed some literature on is nothing that we are recommending. What we are recommending is only 14 hours on most days and uh, uh, up to 20 hours, 24 hours, once a week. This is an outpatient setting. In the in-hospital setting, what we are going to recommend is patients, we are going to give them the knowledge, empowerment, so that they can try it on the first day, second day, third day. When they are in the hospital, as many hours as they can, comfortably. If the, the food will be brought to them three times a day, and we are going to request them to try and turn it away. That is the empowerment aspect of our program. Arnand. Uh, good evening, Flacker. I am Dr. Chokalingam from India. I really appreciate Anand. One small question. How is that obesity paradox? You don't want to reduce weight. Why? What is the mechanism for that? Why does it paradox occur? So I showed a slide, but uh, first I want to thank you for the most important slide that I showed, which is uh, the study on postprandial angina. That is in 2002. Right. Because of the mechanism, we are able to confidently say eating adds stress not only to the stenosed uh, coronary arteries, but also for the idiopathic heart failure patients. So adding food is not healthy when you are in acute heart failure. That's the first thing. And your answer to the obesity paradox, which we see across the spectrum of cardiometabolic disease, is because these studies are done over three months to one year, maximum three years. And in that short span, the obesity actually ends up being um, like a buffer. They are more metabolic reserve. So it's like when there is no gas in the tank, if you're trying to go downhill, it, you're lucky. If you are trying to go on a plain road, you cannot go very far if there is no gas in your tank. Your car is going to stop on the highway. So that is the analogy that I will give. I no, another thing you... I want to huh? stress uh, on and then flacker. Myocardium at a greatest stress. Our aim is to unload it by means of fasting. One, it reduces the salts, reduces the pressure that the afterload is reduced. It reduces the preload because of diuresis and the water intake, everything. So unloading is effectively acting on the myocardium to improve the condition by both of afterload and preload reduction, which you are going to get it by means of fasting. One, two, your stress of the fasting in acute failure is going to have so much a beneficial of giving you gratitude, happiness, and everything. I think the greatest role for primordial, primary, secondary, tertiary pre prevention of all heart ailments, all the importance of fasting, I think you must inculcate this habit of the intake of food, all one must from childhood itself. 
So if it's going to have enormous benefit for acute failure, so you can stress how much of enormous benefit to prevent the heart ailment to live healthy for even up to 100 years, minimally without any problem. That is what I personally feel and your study must be extended to for primary and primordial prevention on it. I really Excellent. appreciate you. your involvement for everything. So happy about it. Thanks so much, Dad. One clarification, or not clarification, in addition to what you just said, is for the last 60 years, Aging studies have shown across unicellular organisms, rodents, rats, monkeys. I know calorie two is the human study showing calorie restriction improves survival. That's what we know over the last 60 years. But over the last five to 10,000 years, that is what Siddhars have been telling us. Eat one meal a day, you will be most healthy and you'll also achieve a higher level of happiness. But if you can do away with just two meals a day, physical health will be optimal. That's what they are suggesting for 5,000 years. Adding now getting more evidence. On and apart from the intake of food or calories for our energy, the most important inner happiness will balance everything. The moment if the person knows how to be happy, you won't be interested in taking food at all. Because basically, he has understood the self-happiness within him and he does not to take because falsely people are tempted to take food that gives them happiness. Smoking gives happiness. So a self-realized person, as our Siddhas told us, the aim is to realize themselves, then they won't need anything for happiness. In that way, everything will become positive for them. I really appreciate, Anand, the enormous study you are going. I'm really happy, Flacker, to see you. All together, you must make the society globally very healthy. Thereby, they become very wealthy too. My best wishes, Flacker. Thank you for attending. Uh, very good, Anand. And I think I'm going to cu cut it off. We're overdue, and I hope we do one, another one of these again. My request is uh, if, for people who want to hang around and discuss, can we leave it open? Sure. I think Brenda can do that. Thanks so I much, think. Dr. Flaker, for joining us. Thank you. Very interesting. I'm happy to answer more questions, or I'm happy to hear your comments and how we can proceed with this research. When you do the fasting with these patients in the hospital, are you going to hold their diuresis? We may be able to reduce their need for Lasix. But for the time being, yeah. we, are, we can try the first day instead of... Uh, it may be more potent as what it could be. We will figure it out when we try it because we don't know how much they are really going to fast. It's only a suggestion that we are going to... Be only a, for the time being, we are not changing any treatment protocol. Whatever we do in the heart patients, we will continue to do. Fasting will be an add-on for the time being. Dr. Uh, Chokkalingam, this is Dr. Viswanathan from Atlanta, VA. Thanks for the wonderful lecture on fasting and uh, ketosis. Um, in outpatient setting, um, how do you educate your patients? Do you have any protocols that you follow? So uh, the recordings that we have on High Life Journey, anybody is welcome to access that and uh, yep. figure it out for themselves. But every three months we do it live also for uh, uh, people anywhere in the world. So we set it up in such a way, Monday mornings, uh, we do it for uh, veterans at the VA, university patients, and people anywhere who are interested they can join us. So the next schedule we don't have yet. January, February series just got completed. So once we have it again, uh, we'll announce it on High Life Journey. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. Any comments from our nephrology colleagues? Thank you, Anand, for the talk. That was really good. Thanks so much for uh, so much. being part of our effort to make a big change in the way we view heart failure. Yes, I think that uh, we very, very often face a reality that is that we exhaust really quickly all the resources that we medically can do uh, talking about procedures, devices, medication, hospitalizations, etc. 
and patients really do not achieve a, like great improvement until until they 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 can make a very very deep change in their behavior and and if there's a strategy that can do that and is safe on top of that it's it's amazing that, that we can try something that that can be more powerful than pretty much all the other interventions that that we do so and of course a lot cheaper too so that is very important for the society that we live it is not a lot cheaper it is actually free or it actually pays free. you, <laughs> it pays <laughs> you because you are paying less for the food that you have to buy every day and the time that you have to cook and things <laughs> like that and it works only right. for i would say one third of our patients i've been doing this now for close to 10 years and i feel two thirds of our patients don't uh, have the interest or the inclination to try these self inquiry methods but for those who are willing to try the results are more than i anticipated or expected or even predicted thank you Any other suggestions, questions? Uh, good evening, Doctor. Uh, I'm Dr. Meena Kumari from uh, National Institute of Siddha, uh, Tambaram, Chennai. And uh, I'm very glad about you to uh, you you mentioned about some Siddha uh, uh, mentioned about the Siddha's uh, ancient quotes concepts here for uh, better living, and uh, it's very interesting. um because we uh, many of the siddha concepts are uh, not based on the scientific backgrounds and um, uh, we have a lot of uh, concepts like this uh, and many concepts now uh, are yet to be explored like this and uh, uh, we are having uh, if we have such opportunity we will join and uh, do our best and the intermittent fasting uh, as siddha told um uh, it is very interesting and uh, uh, and you are you are mentioning about the um self realization and to uh, 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 and want to uh, attain their uh, eternal bliss uh, it's very interesting and uh, uh, faculty still powers of human beings which is mentioned in siddha's uh, science uh sorry uh, this is the fact every human to know uh, about their uh, ability and uh, inner conscious consciousness yeah about you sir and uh, yeah, if uh, time permits we will have another uh, chat uh, regarding this siddha in each and every aspects of life Uh, thank, thank you so you. much there is so much depth thank you so to, much sir thanks so much for joining there is so much depth to siddha uh, that uh, we still don't recognize in the western world how it can be useful even the allied and uh, holistic uh, schools that are in the us they don't uh, have that much awareness of siddha concepts and myself i talk about siddha but only in the uh, consciousness aspects i don't have any expertise in the herbal medicines and so many other uh, facets of uh, siddha but uh, what we are seeing in our population here is the patients are able to trust themselves and engage in this uh, meditative uh, gratitude based fasting so that is what is empowering them to lose this much weight which is not recognized in any other i many of these patients that i shared today don't come mm-hmm. to see me every two months they may see me even once a year so that's the benefit that they are doing it on their own i don't tell them how many times to eat or how many calories to eat and they come off nine out of 10 medicines and that is because of their own self inquiry and that is what siddha talks about you are uh, answerable only to yourself at the highest level and uh, uh, that is what i feel is the empowerment that comes from our uh, siddha consciousness thank you sir thank you so much thank you
we still have quite a few people. I'm here, so I'm hoping to hear some more concerns with heart failure, how this might work, might not work, what we should look out for, what your experience has been. So it's our chance to refine our tools before we actually embark on a prospective effort. Anand, the way in which you have been now telling and scientifically proving, and then the role of heart transplantation really may come down. <laughs> that two, is very far away. <laughs> and the two is those undergone heart transplantation, even in my setup in India, we have seen many patients after transplantation, they go for angina, they go for cardiac failure, renal failure. I think post-transplant people, they must much more careful, at least what the benefit they had in the transplant to sustain for a longer time, your way of teaching and your way of life, what you have been instructing may be highly beneficial. That's what I personally feel, how it can be effectively and must be true for all post-tented patients, all after bypass surgery, they all think is a cure, is only still a palliative, and there will be enormous benefit in the long run if you are going to strictly get into the picture of your eye life. I really feel like that after hearing your talk now. Very well, it might work. Hey, Anand, thanks for uh, the talk. This is Saravanan here, Swami from Atlanta. Thanks for connecting hey, us nice. with our uh, Siddha practitioner, Saravana. Uh -huh. Thanks it's for definitely, like you said, the depth of knowledge is pretty intense and uh, it's very hard for a lot of the concepts to be understood without having the foundation of it. Um, so I think uh, we can come up with some ways of knowing the foundation easier. But with your protocol itself, why did you choose acute heart failure in the hospital setting? And um, why not in the outpatient setting in the usual CHF exacerbation where we can clearly measure and readmission rate or something like that as an endpoint? In and the, the second part of the question uh, is like, do you want to do a multi-center so that we can also participate? Anybody else can participate in that uh, trial. I'll tell you this uh, very interesting. Uh, when I showed you the 10, 15 patients' stories in slides, many of them already were in the hospital when their uh, uh, self-inquiry started. So that's all we are trying to do formally. There is no other difference. If you look between acute and chronic heart failure or sta stabilized heart failure, there is not that much pathophysiological difference. It's just that their volume is better, their hemodynamics are a little better. I believe not only the chronic benefits, but even in the acute phase, there are so many ways that fasting can uh, get the patient stabilized sooner, may save life. And especially with cardiorenal syndrome, there are so many times when kidney function is getting worse, heart failure is not getting better, we don't yet want to initiate uh, dialysis or ultrafiltration. So we wait for a couple of days. In those couple of days in the hospital, if we fast them, they may get better sooner. That is what I feel. And uh, we, we may not, we, unless we test it formally, we may not know the answer, but I feel based on all the animal evidence pointing towards it and uh, our own experience in the last five years in the outpatient setting, that the benefits could be significant. And same thing like beta blockers. We use it in the acute heart failure cases because we want them to have better compliance. We know in the first three days in the hospital, it's not going to make anything any better for them. Same thing if the patient realizes eating lesser and connecting with hunger is going to help them when they're in the hospital, it might sustain even when they go home. BMI of 30 on average for all heart failure in the US in 2021 is just too high. And it, uh, higher weight means more cardiac workload. That's what it just translates into. So if we can reduce it over weeks, over months, we are going to really help them in the big picture. As far as doing it in a multi-center way, the protocol we are hoping to draft is going to be very, very simple because we are not setting very strict parameters to follow. And uh, we are actually letting the patient do whatever they can, and we are just going to track what they are doing. So we'll be glad to have you and uh, centers in India. Anybody who want, wishes to help us, we can uh, gather answers sooner. Thank you. Oh, 
Arul, anybody else wishes to tell us uh, from nephrology, from Siddha, psychiatry also, we had some colleagues join us. Anand, can I make one small comment? Time permits, I don't know how far others will. But human psychology generally have seen, they always stimulate the sympathetic activity with hope they want to shine. And then all the drugs you are giving, you want to reduce the sympathetic, make the parasympathetic drive to increase by means of self-realization. So the moment you are going to improve, increase the sympathetic one, as in medical in cardiology, we use beta blocker, alpha blocker, calcium blocker, AC blocker, all blockers you are using to only block what the persons have stimulated to the extent that it is going to improve that. But unfortunately, by means of your technique, make the parasympathetic to get activated. That will result in endorphin, melatonin, serotonin like that. Ask them to balance sympathetic drive to come down, what it does when tra trailing at that time. Activate the parasympathetic, so there is no need to have any drugs and balance that one, that is enough. I think we must go in depth about how we can tell them practically and scientifically how all the modality is going to help them. In Thank heart failure, sympathetic activation is even more, so that might be something we can test, but again, it will add cost. Uh, to, if we get a grant, then that would be a good thing to look at uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine serum levels, whether by fasting we are able to bring it down sooner. That's an excellent suggestion. It uh, ought to come because the benefit is like that. It should be, but only thing proof of it, you have to do that on it in your site. Priya, anybody else? Any other suggestions, questions? Excellent. Thanks, Dad, for joining us. Thanks for pointing towards uh, some valuable things that we can uh, pursue in our research. And uh, when we, Saranan asked, why are you doing it in acute heart failure in the hospital? One, they may get better, but more than that, we want to uh, highlight the importance of uh, patient uh, taking uh, more responsibility for their health. That is the real basis for uh, what we are trying to move towards in the next few years. Thanks so much. I'm happy to answer any other quick uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dad. Thank you, Dr. Chakalinga.